I just presented uh, results from uh, our study looking at uh, patients who have been on a brutinib that then progress um, trying to identify uh, mutations uh, in the B cell receptor and NF-kappa B pathway uh, that are present at baseline that could potentially predict the clinical outcome of the patients. So we know that uh, from other studies that mutations in BTK and PLC gamma 2 are present in about 80% of patients who end up progressing on ibrutinib. Uh, but in at least in our, in our cohort of 84 patients, um, when we tested for these mutations, um, really you couldn't detect any mutations beyond 15 months before clinical progression, definitely not before base, definitely not at the time of treatment initiation. So the goal of this study was to ask whether there are other mutations that fall in the same pathway um, that we could easily detect at baseline and uh, whether they were helpful at all for us in terms of predicting outcome down the road. So um, to do this, we sequenced um, a subset of patients. So we sequenced a total of 45 patients enrolled on the study. Um, and we found that more than a third, so 38% of patients, indeed, they had mutations at baseline uh, in the BCRNF kappa B pathway. Um, and um, in terms of response to brutinib, it seemed like didn't really matter whether you had the pathway mutations or not. Um, all patients responded initially. So the response rate at six months, um, everybody had achieved a PR or PRL in this uh, current study, uh, with the exception of two patients uh, who had stable disease, uh, but they were actually not the patients with the pathway mutations. Um, but uh, despite you know the very similar early treatment response, when we follow these patients longer, uh, we find that um, actually patients with these pathway mutations actually had a shorter progression-free survival. Uh, so it was interesting to us because it's not entirely clear what the mechanisms uh, are that uh, led to this increased risk of progression. Um, one thing that we did find was that patients who had these pathway mutations at baseline tended to have a a uh, higher mutation burden. So just the total number of mutations that a patient uh, tumor cells have uh, to begin with. And um, one hypothesis we have is whether that this uh, presence of pathway mutations is a marker for greater genomic instability and uh, ability of the CLL to then evolve and adapt to therapy. Um, so um, that's kind of, you know, we're trying to answer these questions right now in the lab. Right now, we really just uh, presented data um, at one time point where we sequence patients at the beginning of therapy. Um, and what the goal uh, going forward is to look at patient samples uh, over time. So uh, over at least early on therapy, maybe even longer, to see whether the uh, composition of mutations in the patient changes over time. Because if the, our hypothesis is that patients who evolve more um, are more likely to progress, then we should see those uh, shifts in mutation uh, frequencies uh, during treatment with ibrutinib. I think this is still in its early phase in terms of, you know, even trying to figure out what um, a marker of um, impending progression is. So it may be too early to think of an intervention, at least uh, for our study. Um, you know, our other groups include, actually uh, some, uh, Dr. Ahn in our lab has looked at um, the canonical mutations in BTK, PLC, gamma 2. And um, we do find it before clinical progression, but it's usually, you know, a year maybe a little bit more than a year, never, never earlier than that. But once we have that information, it's not entirely clear um, what could be done about it at this point. There's no, uh, we don't have an armament of drugs um, to, that, uh, we don't have evidence to show that treating the presence of these mutant clones early makes a difference. Um, so for now, our approach has been that, you know, when the patients do eventually progress, then they move on to alternative therapies such as venetoclax.